thank you very much for the great introduction to all those different uh, and difficult subjects. And now imagine also that uh, perhaps some militaries around the world would have technology kind of 30 years ahead of what is commercially known. And in what time are we living? And is regulation still coming on time? Question mark. I mean, even the Intercept has been raising this uh, question. Uh, have SSS actually helped to avoid regulation? How well are we doing? Or are we seeing basically a moral collapse of AI ethics? Um, that would be my next slide. And here we go. So today I'm going to talk about some possible data-driven societies and their issues. And some variants of those societies are likely to be in existence in some places around the world. There's no question we're living in a time of big data. Um, big data is often called the new oil of the digital age and the motor would be the AI systems. And of course, these are just symbolic uh, ways of talking about it, but uh, certainly it gives you some ideas of uh, what may be ahead. Um, this graph over here from Ray Kutz, well, of course, is very controversial, um, but uh, just to remind you, he expected that we would have AI as powerful as one human brain in 2020, that was about two years ago, and we'll have um, AI as powerful as all human brains by 2060. And you don't have to believe that, but uh, if you believe it too late, then it's too late, right? Um, anyway, so even if it doesn't come that extreme, there are all sorts of issues, including privacy issues connected with surveillance, scoring, targeting. And of course, people were alerted by this issue of this issue basically when Edward Snowden reported about NSA mass surveillance on the insiders knew about that before I would say and that this is when politicians and the public started thinking about it but a lot of people are not really aware what that means it means in particular that it's possible to find your voice even if you don't have your own smartphone with you. So just suppose you're on holiday, you're making a digital detox, you left your smartphone at home and you're talking to somebody at the beach bar, but there's some other smartphone and that could be used to locate you, identify you, listen into what you're saying, basically putting speech to text, translating that in real time and searching it for certain kind of keywords and the helicopter comes, right? <laughs> and uh, this is not the only thing, of course, cameras could also be used to do all sorts of things, including analyzing your emotions and whether you're telling the truth or not. And so remote sensing is becoming, of course, very interesting and this could include your heartbeat and perhaps even your EEG, that means your brain activity. Uh, it's hard to imagine how that would work, but I'll address some of this later to some extent, a, a little, I should say. Already back in 2013, CIA Director Gus Hunt informed us or warned us uh, that we are already a walking sensor platform. It's really very nearly within our grasp, he said, to be able to compute on all human-generated information. And most people really have no idea of what all human-generated information would encompass. It would for sure encompass data from all sorts of sensors that are in our smartphones, but also distributed all over our environment, talking about cyber-physical systems and Internet of Things, you would not see it in most cases. And there's a lot more in the pipeline, including quantum computing, which will accelerate computing a lot. <laughs> 100 million times sounds quite a lot, right? Um, and that's probably not the end. And then you need, uh, of course, a lot higher data transmission rates, and that would come through light 
based transmission, Li-Fi rather than Wi-Fi and um, LED could be one of the systems uh, used for this and just to make you aware. And it could also be in our smartphones. And it's also interesting for up to genetic applications. And interestingly, um, this goes potentially together with RNA. So we will just keep that in mind. And um, here is an interesting information from a box of an Academy of Technology brochure back from the year 2015 or 16, uh, where it says optogenetics um, does research about ways of um, kind of steering nerve activity based on genetically modified cells. Just you know, be aware of that. Who who would uh, modify your cells and how? That's the question, right? Anyway, so coming back to cybernetic societies, this idea is really old, and uh, Norbert Wiener was uh, one of the people promoting it, and it's interesting that um, he was really using that idea to create a concept of how the human mind works, human beings act, and uh, how to run entire societies based on information feedbacks. And we've seen already this book over here, so I don't need to go into this. So the idea of cybernetic societies is really not new. So the question is, where do we stand? And I think we really need to look into what is now called Society 5.0. And that apparently is related to Industry 4.0. And the idea is that it would be an entirely new form of society. You know, so basically Society 1.0 would have been the hunter, hunting, hunter and gatherer society, and then Society 2.0, agrarian society, 3.0 industrial society. The information society was society 4.0. That's basically perhaps already behind us. And there would be a new society enabled by the fourth industrial revolution. Now, if you want to read a bit more, because we haven't re read a lot in the newspapers and seen a lot on TV about this, there are a couple of books. And in order to understand what it is about, we need to know more about industry 4.0, and that's about cyber-physical systems. I mean, it relates to the Internet of Things, in fact, the Internet of Everything, as some people say, and it relates to attempts to automate systems on large scales. It's about industrial approaches. It's about artificial intelligence and advanced robotics, but also gene editing. So here we go again. Right now, what can you do with all this? So basically, it's almost a bit outdated, I would say, surveillance capitalism. So as uh, former Google CEO said, uh, the company knew where we were, what we were um, doing, and what we were thinking about. And we're all being profiled and targeted, you know, all of us. And that creates basically digital doubles or avatars and, or di digital twins, as I will uh, say later on. So this would really give highly detailed pictures of our personality. In fact, there's a company that's called Crystal Nose that offered insights into anyone's personality. You know, it could be your neighbor, your colleague, your competitor, your enemy, uh, whoever, you know. Uh, for some time, I think it was accessible just for free, you know, <laughs> to some extent. All right, so, and that certainty endangers another thing human dignity. So there's a red line that uh, can be crossed and that uh, I would think has been crossed, uh, which is very concerning, but it doesn't stay there because all that data about your personality is being used for manipulation. And 
we basically became something like laboratory rats of companies, but not only, but also of cities, like smart cities and smart societies. And we're being manipulated in our choices and our thinking and our emotions. Tristan Harris, who's worked in a Google control room, has explained it quite clearly that a handful of tech companies control billions of minds every day which would include your minds. And how does that work? Um, basically, they're doing A-B testing. So they're basically um, confronting us with all sorts of information, which has been personalized and varied. And they make measurements all the time in order to figure out how we respond to certain kinds of information, how we can be triggered in a sense. And they're also using all those cognitive biases that exist, actually quite a lot of them, of course, our brain is a highly efficient device. It just uh, consumes about 40 to 100 watts. And that is very little, just as much as a light bulb, in a sense, uh, and does a lot more tricky things. Um, and it's so efficient because it takes shortcuts, and that creates possibilities to hack our brain, in a sense. You know, so there are the, uh, devices that can be used against us. And it's being done by advertisement companies, but also by secret services and militaries. And we've learned about it um, when Edward Snowden reported about JTRIC, a secret program at that time, um, which we saw would be used against, say, terrorists and enemies of state and so on. But uh, you should better assume that uh, we're all the targets of that kind of technology by now. And in fact, um, at some point in time, it was related to the Cambridge Analytica uh, election manipulation scandal. The public learned about the fact that weaponized propaganda AI was used to manipulate democratic elections and our brains, in a sense. Technology that knows us better than we know ourselves. I think actually the digital manifesto might have played a role in the public learning about all this. It also had also the implications. You see, John uh, John Havens has actually tweeted about the English translation of the digital manifesto, which uh, took about a year to be published. Uh, so they held it back for a long time. And in that time, uh, also an initiative was triggered. Uh, related to ethically aligned design that Zara has really uh, made very substantial contributions to. And uh, this resulted in this wonderful book uh, that just recently was published about this um, new um, norm, the IEEE norm P7000, right? About um, va value-based engineering. And um, so some things have happened, um, but also there are new threats. And um, some of them are related to censorship and proper propaganda is a very old principle. But in the meantime, propaganda has been personalized. And so it's much more effective. And in many cases, you would not even notice we have been exposed to propaganda. And in the meantime, we're basically living in what is sometimes called uh, Factory world or post factual society. We're basically all web pages could be personalized. Even if we click the same link, we may see different content. It's possible to make people say something that they've never said and would basically would sound like that person actually said it. And same thing about videos. So videos can be manipulated in real time and we're therefore living now in times of deep fakes and i'm not sure you have seen actually this advertisement of uh, mark zuckerberg of meta and the metaverse he's talking about an hour or so about the vision of this new platform And it's not clear, is it Mark Zuckerberg or is it his avatar? I personally think it was actually his digital twin. Um, so it's a deep fake. 
from the beginning to the end. Uh, have a look. Perhaps you don't agree, but um, I do think it's actually not him. All right, smart cities. Um, one other cybernetic form of society and based on all sorts of sensor data, of course, and um, we can do wonderful things with that, no question. But we also put city life under a microscope, which means also we put citizens potentially under a microscope. And some people get pretty much concerned about it because uh, this smart city approach could be also a digital nightmare, a surveillance nightmare. Uh, a digital zoo in a sense where we would be surveilled 24-7 um, and cities would be managed in a data-driven way and we would basically have to take it. So the, the question is, could cities really be run like a huge machine? And if yes, uh, would it be a good idea? And I don't think so. I don't think it's just a giant logistics system. I don't think it's a giant entertainment park Cities are places where people make friends, um, fall in love, have new ideas, get creative and co-create the future. And uh, that cannot be done by a um, huge automated machine. So there are limits and issues of automation. And uh, we've also pointed that out again in the recent paper on the role of complexity for digital twins. So basically many digital twin concepts neglect complexity to a large extent. And that is extremely concerning, I would say. And here is another book chapter that's coming up, actually in a book that's um, edited by Andre and also by Oscar. Uh, Javier is involved as a co-author. So here we really talk about digital trends from infrastructures to societies and say what levels of complexity come in and uh, what are the ethical and other issues um, related to those complexities? And perhaps you want to have a look at that. Um, then there are systems and societies based on citizen scores, um, not just in China, which became kind of famous for their experiment with social credit scores, but also in the West, we have, of course, all sorts of scoring systems, uh, including customer lifetime values, for example. And even the former president of the European Commission, no, uh, Parliament, actually, um, Martin Schulz has warned us, we need to fight now against technological totalitarianism. And in fact, I think that technology has risen around the world in many countries and um, has contributed to the fact that democracies are on retreat. It's, it's, it's interesting that you don't see that slide because so, somehow it should be already switched one slide. So you, well, you should have seen this. And um, also in the Netherlands, for example, there's a citizen score that many people don't know of. And uh, the World Economic Forum is also working on at least one such score, which is the My Carbon score. So I overall am very concerned about those scoring approaches, as I've pointed out over here, because I don't think they're suited uh, to reflect the complexity of the world or do any justice to people. And there are many things that cannot really be well measured, including human dignity. So we shouldn't do such a thing. Then there is the principle code is law. And uh, that has been introduced by Lawrence Lessig. And uh, basically it talks about the fact that algorithms increasingly decide what can be done and what not. And it's uh, important in particular for digital policing, but not only, there's also legal tech uh, that becomes now quite popular increasingly. And there are all sorts of pre-crime programs around the world, which are now coming increasingly under scrutiny. And, and particularly it turns out that those algorithms are 
racist and sexist and some people think they should be dismantled uh, at least they need to be fixed but perhaps they cannot even be reasonably fixed um, there's also a very high error rate uh, which people don't talk much about so basically list of suspects are terribly long often contain millions of people to be aware of that and those systems are not only being used to find murderers and uh, burglar people who, who thieves and, and and all of that but um, basically they're trying to determine the value of a person based on their personality and what they do and think and to um, contribute to society and we don't know what the criteria are in many cases so talking about the karma police program which is also a social credit score Basically, it seems like the West has invented it, China has tested it, um, and people got very concerned. Also, the Human Rights Court had to jump in, but it probably does not solve all the problems. And that's why we have pointed out when code is law, algorithms must be made transparent. Because otherwise, there is no feedback, no quality control. We cannot improve them. Uh, we cannot fix them and there are a lot of issues with a lot of algorithms i should say then another concept that's being discussed a lot is cashless society and uh, the question is um, would it be the future of money a utopia dystopia who knows uh, there would be benefits and costs um, is it problematic there are some papers about it but the point is that basically all the transactions that you do everything you, you buy or sell would be recorded and perhaps the data kept forever that would tell a lot about your personality and habits of course and the data could also be however used to control consumption patterns so um, if you already had a flight this year perhaps they would block other bookings or further flights or if you you know, perhaps you would not be allowed to, to have an own vehicle or um, you had the stake already on Tuesday, so you're not going to have another one on Wednesday. And, and all these kinds of things would be possible in principle, so algorithms could determine what's feasible and what not. That would be um, so-called um, control, uh, called control economy, and some people are very concerned about it, but it uh, could be really a total surveillance also through this kind of cashless society approach. Plus the question is, how would actually the digital ID be defined? And there are different possibilities, of course, a lot of that is uh, related to biometrics, uh, like fingerprints or face recognition or so, but that's not where it ends. Now there's nanotechnology that you can also use basically for EIDs and for digital currencies and all these kinds of things. So basically your body would become your bank account and the password for everything, you know? I mean, technologically feasible, just think about it. Um, and that's why we had uh, to point out that perhaps this is not the way we want to go. Plus, this is by far not the end of what becomes feasible in the future. There could be in-body surveillance and remote control in perspective. So I need to talk about nanotechnology and the internet of bodies. Back in 2020, the World Economic Forum was kind enough to inform us that tracking how our bodies work could change our lives. And they were talking about nanotechnologies in particular in this connection and they were actually saying the internet of bodies is here you know that was one and a half years ago i believe or two more than two years ago um, in fact um so it's here all right so what is it then um it's often called internet of nano things or bio nano things and basically the idea is that you would expose bodies to nanoparticles that would be absorbed by body cells and um, those nanoparticles could be used basically to for example refract 
radiation and thereby read out data and uh, smartphones, for example, could be devices in order to collect that kind of data. And in fact, there are quite a few papers in the meantime, so it's unbelievable, but in fact, there's a lot of science about it and some of it is published. So have a look at that. And then it doesn't stop there. So basically, and once you have an internet of bodies, you also think about, oh, could we pay, perhaps read out um, what people think about? Uh, we've heard about that already in Emily's talk, you know, that hopefully helped to, to make a bit more believable of what I'm talking about over here, because, you know, I couldn't believe it for a long time, to be honest, right? So... In particular, it was the Brain Initiative mission. I was kind of the US version of the Human Brain Project. Um, they put $3 billion initially into this, and they wanted to, to um, be able to understand the inner workings of the human mind, improve how we treat, prevent, and cure disorders of the brain, including behavioral disorders, by the way. And in connection with this, there's a brain activity mapping project. And there is a scientific paper about that. It gives us more insights. And here it says, nanoscience and nanotechnology are poised to provide a rich toolkit of novel methods to explore brain function by enabling simultaneous measurement and manipulation of activity of thousands or even millions of neurons. We and others refer to this goal as a brain activity mapping project. And I would uh, create a hell lot of data, of course, and IBM was kind enough to inform us about that. So, well, a couple of years back, data doubled every year. That means in one year, we produce as much data as in all years of human history before. Data will be soon doubling every 12 hours. That means in half a day, we'll produce as much data as in all human history before, just to give you an idea. You know, this is to some extent already happening. So um, there are also scientific papers about human brain uh, cloud interfaces. Some of that, of course, is theoretical, but just think of what uh, the military might be able to do already. And that would bring us from surveillance capitalism to neurocapitalism, where not only would be possible to know about what you do and what you're thinking about and your personality, but also to influence all of that and ch change your personality, you know, if somebody wanted this, for example, or your memories, and people are working on these kinds of things, right? And that's why Marcelo and I have written this paper that uh, international regulation is needed. In fact, um, there are quite a few laws that we think would apply, but you know they would have to be applied basically in order to protect us, and that is not happening. Is actually also, uh, as it turns out, quite uh, an issue to get this paper published. You know, it's just laying there with the editors, you know, forever, and uh, so basically they're kind of obstructing forces, and <clears throat> these are easy to understand once uh, we think about the militarization of bodies and minds, because that is definitely on the way. And of course, they claim they're all doing it for good of humanity. So the question is, could we now control the world through a war room, basically, you know, in a data-driven way, using AI to optimize the world and uh, put it on the best possible path and basically enforce it. Um, that's the idea. And uh, one of the projects uh, in that connection is the Sentient World Simulation Project. And basic, basically that's a multi-agent simulation where all of us are represented through an agent, which is a kind of a learning black box, which is being fed with surveillance data to become ever more similar to us. I mean, produce a digital twin that behaves like us. And that's being used for psyops, I mean, to change people's thinking, but also for all sorts of warfare. And uh, you can be sure this is playing into world affairs any moment in time, in any place. Um, in fact, um, Edward Snowden um, 
seems to have suggested that this may be the real reason for the mass surveillance that we're having at the moment. There are so scientific papers about it. Not much detail is known about it, but there are some documents that basically uh, say, uh, and let us know that this is real. And in the meantime, besides land, water, air, space, and cyber, there is a sixth domain of warfare, which is called cognitive warfare. And in fact, there is a publication in uh, one of the military uh, Dutch newspapers, and this is quite informative. I really recommend you to read it. It also shows you, you know, uh, to what extent human dignity is gone. And uh, this kind of cognitive warfare is, is happening not only in war against the enemies, but it's also to prepare your own population and it's even in peacetime. So basically this is happening all the time and every one of us is the target of that. And uh, there are more documents. I've really collected a long list of this. Uh, also, the NATO has published a couple of documents about it. And so this is present reality. And the question that comes up in this connection is, is our civilization being replaced by our militarization? You know, and how would that feel like? Would it be a good idea or... You know, would we be living in a perpetual war, in a sense? And there was also a session of an Agesta event about um, the limits of digitalization of conflict, and it basically revealed that there is a hyper personalization of conflict already and use of nanotechnology in wars. There's also a paper where we try to raise attention for this, also face uh, the same issues. Um, everyone finds it interesting, apparently, but it's somehow not welcome in a journal. And uh, anyway, so judge it for yourself. And then there's the right to life, which also kind of um, poses um, issues and uh, there's a lot of discussion about trolley problems in triage and I believe this has to do with in particular the, the club of Rome's limit to growth study where they basically project that in 2020 uh, services per capita would basically collapse and in other words our economy would collapse and with a, a few years later there would be an explosion of uh, deaths of humans and uh, and therefore uh, we would really see some kind of apocalypse and would create all sorts of ethical dilemmas. And uh, this has been talked about in connection with automatic driving, but in fact, I think it's about really the unsustainability of the world uh, has been implicitly talked about. Um, and there was this moral machine experiment, which I'm very much concerned about. And in fact, uh, shortly before the pandemic, 11,000 scientists pointed out that the Earth needs fewer people to beat the climate crisis. Um, shortly later, uh, you could read uh, all sorts of messages about um, triage and that was happening during the COVID-19 pandemic. We'd been warning about those kind of applications of, of triage and folly problems uh, to people and humanity back 2017 and forward in many papers and newspaper articles. And partly also because um, it's not so clear how world population will actually develop. And the turning point, if you want to determine it, it really depends on late data points. I mean, it cannot be predicted early on. In the meantime, in fact, newspaper pretty much say perhaps the population bomb that uh, many people have uh, been alerted about uh, for a long time and uh, sounded the alarm off may never go off. So we really, we, we need to, to be very careful about these kinds of things. This is crossing all the lines, but in fact, there's one more line, which is the end of humanity. I'm talking here about uh, transhumanism, in fact. So there are um, pretty famous people who've been warning about it. Elon Musk, Steve Wozniak from Apple, uh, and many others, Stephen Hawkins, also uh, Jeffrey Hinton recently, and um, some 
people who believe in technology-driven development of humankind think also there would be a human-machine convergence. And in fact, um, it seems like transhumanist politics has already begun in the USA, but also in Europe. And Yuval Harari has um, tried to alert people, also published quite uh, controversial subjects, but um, at least um, I, I think this point needs to be taken seriously that humans become hackable by new kinds of technology on both their thinking and their biological and genetic makeup, in fact. And this is about human augmentation. Uh, here's a brochure by the military, Canadian and German military. And basically they say, uh, we cannot wait for ethics. You know, basically we need to start doing it. Uh, and we're doing it already. So basically have a look at this brochure. I think it's pretty revealing and concerning, uh, but some people do believe that you would see a singularity, super intelligence, and digital god, and that would be our mission to build it, and we would just be a transition state, um, and then basically humans have done their job and nobody needs them anymore, and that seems to be the kind of thinking of uh, people like Jürgen Schmidhuber, at least that's how I interpreted um, his words. Uh, Ray Kurzweil is another one of those people who do think that uh, Transhumanism will make us godlike. And there is even an area that's called apocalyptic AI. And it's a, it's a, a serious book. It's, it's not a fictional book. It's um and um you know they, they consider this actually a positive development. You would not even believe that. Um I would not have noticed if Robert Garachi was not have uh, would not have been invited to um event but that was basically sponsored by the German government. And that made me really think about it in an even more concerned way. So basically these people do think that uh, those people who would not be willing to undergo this transhumanist transformation towards um you know new um, cognitive state and new uh, form of existence would basically be left behind and uh, so basically normal humans would not exist for much longer and there's also a talk that I really recommend you to have a look at which is on eugenics and the promise of utopia to um, artificial general intelligence so there's um, reasons to warn about visual threats to humans and society. That's a uh, text that I've written actually in connection with uh, some activities um, that we've had together recently. It uh, didn't find its way in the final uh, document for formatting reasons, but um, similar words are being voiced by other people like, uh, as I said, Geoffrey Hinton recently. Yeah, I'm, I'm finishing. So uh, we, we definitely need an ethical approach. We pointed that out already uh, 10 years ago, and uh, for some people even earlier. There have been quite a lot of publications about it, about the societal, economic, ethical, and legal implications. There was a digital manifesto. There was a PhD program at TU Delft um, aiming at engineering social technology for a responsible digital future. That initiative has taken a value-sensitive design perspective. Uh, we've suggested that we would need to replace war rooms by peace rooms, and that we need to build digital democracy and learn basically how to use digital technology to upgrade democracies and build um, democracy by design. Then the question is, what does democracy mean? You know, what are the values that would have to be coded? into all those algorithms and uh, among those would also have to be informational self-determination and of course um, some opportunities to still take decisions right um, certain things we want to be automated uh, we don't want to waste our times in bad decisions but we still uh, want to have some freedom of choice um, among 
various good decisions um, and that needs to be coded for and otherwise you know all the freedom would be gone and i think that's actually not a good idea so if you want to know more actually i've been reflecting on those questions a little bit in some of those books and uh, we've tried to uh, voice our opinions on a number of different concepts, including digital enlightenment, peace rooms, algorithmic transparency, digital democracy, platforms for information and self determination, city Olympics and challenges, and participate reformats that bring in citizens uh, towards co creation of the future, democratic capitalism, which I think would be the only system really to be uh, suited for these new um, converging technologies a new social ecological finance system and uh, digitally assisted self organization this is um really at the end thank you thank you Dick. we have just a few minutes for questions please we have some that um you know what i'm wondering what is happening here like what's why especially hawaii put us all in a certain bubble of what the future looks like and what technology can do for us. Mm -hmm. And you are criticizing the technology in that fantastic bubble that they are having us all the day. Why? Because in truth, digitalization has used problems, it doesn't work. That's why our phones break up five times while we are speaking. Um, all this brain reading stuff is um, it's, it's just not working. There are some things that work, yeah. But um, I have to work here, yeah. That we intelligent people spend our time on discussing this big bubble. It's even published in April and the bed in April instead of working on the art to truly the future. Um, I think what the new threat is that they have hijacked our continent. And um uh, and I uh, whilst I see everything you said, and this is something that is infected all over from the ninety nine point nine percent of our conversation. Um, I have turned away from that. We have, for example, founded a group where um, it's called Contesting Computer Anthropology. It starts with, no, sorry, you can't read the brain. You can't upload it. You can't, don't know what people are thinking. It's just this pastor. Like often the cross, I don't know if you're very well. It's like a dream to them. So I'm wondering, you are warning a lot uh, of us to, to a certain extent, I agree to that because you are, you are warning against what has captured our fantasy and people are working in fantasies and always work in fantasies as long as it has as exists. But I think the best way to work on it is to say it. Okay. All right, so let me say a few words on this. I, I think it's a, it's a good point that you're making, uh, if you, in fact. Um, so on on the one hand, um, I I don't think that we should only be concerned of advanced technology that's working well and perhaps not according to our values, but we perhaps need to be even more concerned about technology that does not work well. And we don't know what mistakes it makes and what side effects it produces. And, and that's why we still need to think about it. And in particular, the purpose of this kind of talks is to make the science, the public and politicians um, aware of developments. And um, cer certainly there is a lot of money going into this, you know, perhaps not good investments, but that would also be concerning, but for sure politicians would need to know about this and would need to somehow respond to this in terms of regulation, because we need to be protected, you know? Maybe if you talk serious, 
<clears throat> well, I do think there are a lot of side effects of the digital revolution that actually need regulation uh, require legal protection. That's number one. And number two, um, in fact, in my team, we're working a lot about uh, alternative approaches, you know, basically everything which is on this last slide, you know, so how would uh, the digitally upgraded democracy look like, you know, how can we support collective intelligence, how can we um, improve voting procedures in ways that benefit more people, um, how could we um, use self-organization, self-control approaches to create more adaptive and better working systems that are well coordinated, but leave freedoms for everyone and also can handle disruptions and all these kind of things. So all of this we are working on. So we, we are working on, you know, the world past the art. <laughs> this kind of apocalypse in a sense, right? We're working on a, a vision of a co-created future how we can use digital technology in a way that empowers people, but also helps uh, coordinate our activities and uh, support truth and peace uh, as much as we can do that in a small team, like, I mean, recently, big team, but it's still small, right? Let me, let me ask you something in this regard, because I think you're touching on something that, that kind of resonated with also with, uh, with what you said in me. Um, so when we use digital technology for enhancing democracies, we mentioned also democratic capitalism. And uh, Emil, you mentioned human flourishing, right? I'm, I'm embarking now on a project that uh, tries to define non-materialist conceptions of human flourishing because we have a fundamental problem in the way we measure society through data that does not capture human flourishing, mm -hmm. particularly those measurements that we have replaced in the pursuit of happiness. We have replaced the concept of happiness with that. Yeah, because that's the one we can measure. Because it is very hard to measure the feeling that we have when we see a child in playground snow. We can kind of picture it in beautiful, colorful graphs uh, on, on MRI scanners uh, where we have no clue what it means because, you know, it's beautiful and the non scientists make ah, <laughs> and the scientists make oh. But, uh, but what, what really matters? I don't think we can capture it in data. I don't think that digital democracy will give us the answers that we are hoping for. I think it will keep us in the trap mm -hmm. because it's data type, because it's using quantitative data. It will keep us in that trap of not letting us break out into what really matters. I'm low, I'm, con mm -hmm. I'm, I'm consciously quoting part of Yeah. It's also mentioned in this recent paper over here, and uh, I tried to alert people a lot before that, um, that basically we, we should not in, embark on this data-driven approach, which basically ignores everything that cannot be measured quantitatively by data, and particularly all those qualities that matter to people, you know, in, including creativity, freedom, love, consciousness, all these kind of things are, if at all, hard to quantify, perhaps even not quantifiable. And quality of life, you know, <laughs> all, all of that basically drops out once we optimize a data-driven society. So while we think it would lead to an optimal society, hence something like a paradise. In fact, it, it turns out to be a dystopia and actually uh, tends to be more hell than heaven. And uh, uh, that is a very important point that we need to discuss more. Yeah.